problem with space here, but okay. Uh, well, um, Tara, uh, everybody, hello. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Daniel. I wanted to say a very warm thank you to Marlene, who is the invisible woman who has who has um, so expertly, professionally, uh, and with great civility managed uh, to herd cats, um, so to say, and here we are, and thanks uh, to you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, you um, have been sitting here for a day, a uh, day and a half, and it's clear that uh, something like um, we are living through a great historical moment, a moment defined in part by this uh, populist upsurge. I'm wondering whether this works, yes. And, um, and uh, it is um, in this context, as you know well, that there is some writing on democracy's uh, wall. Things are not going very well. Uh, much worse, in fact, than uh, many intellectuals and journalists and others expected. And it's in this context that parallels are being drawn with the 1920s and the 1930s, in a period where Wilsonian democracy uh, mostly failed uh, in the European region. There is, in this discussion about the historical comparisons, uh, the point that actually that period was a period of great uh, shocks. 19 million people died in uh, World War I and um, perhaps 23 million people wounded. There was um, an economic collapse. There was the rise of fascism. There was the Bolshevik Revolution and so on. And by contrast, or so it seems, our times are more funereally paced. Things are more uh, slow motion. Uh, we hear, of course, widespread complaints about um, and righteous anger directed at out-of-touch governments, corrupt politicians, sluggish economies, rising inequality, greedy banks and corporations, um, broken promises, and so on. And it's in this context that it seems to me uh, with uh, some uh, historical sense, which I think has been rather underdeveloped in this conference uh, in the matter of populism. It's in this uh, sense that I want to go back a hundred years and I want to look at two texts, um, two uh, characters, uh, one of whom will be known to you, the other may not, Max Weber, uh, I'm going to say a few things about his Politik als Beruf, uh, published in 1919, a speech uh, that he gave, a very uh, classical text. And on the right, uh, Loriano Vianilla Lanz, who may not be known to you. Uh, I will say something uh, about him in just a moment. And I want to suggest to you that um, these two texts, both published, uh, in 1919, just over a century ago, are texts that uh, confront a new development in that 1920s, uh, early 20s uh, period, um, namely the appearance of the people on the stage of history. This is the period where enfranchisement of uh, uh, people, uh, women in some countries eventually uh, get the right to vote, these two uh, thinkers, in their own way, uh, I want to suggest as an opening thought, uh, correctly spotted two species of populism that are, so to say, with us today. And uh, as in all my work, I make the case for going backwards, of developing a pair of eyes in our heads to learn from the past, to make better sense of the present. The point being that if you ignore the past, invariably you misunderstand uh, the present. Max Weber, it seems to me, in Politics als uh, Beruf, in this uh, uh, famous text, uh, writes about and makes a prediction that bureaucratic, capitalist, state-organized um, systems with 
elections and with the universal franchise will experience what he called Führer Demokratie. It's a bit of an embarrassing term uh, today, a century later. Um, his idea, sometimes called plebiscitarian leader democracy, is that for a whole variety of reasons, um, parliamentary democracies would witness, um, he thought best developed in the American presidential system, would witness the growth of not only machine politics, but leaders who would act um, in the name of the folk, in the name of the people. Max Weber, as we know, did not foresee Hitler. He died in June uh, 1920, luckily, one could say, because um, the phenomenon of Hitler, uh, a species of Führer Demokratie produced by uh, elections and a failed uh, political economy and state, would have put to the test Max Weber's thesis. But developing this idea of Führer Demokratie, I want to uh, call it electoral populism. Uh, and th th what I'm going to say in very summary form is that the first species of populism that I want to speak about, this electoral populism, is a thoroughly democratic phenomenon as Max Weber himself understood. Electoral populism of the kind that we are witnessing globally uh, requires freedom of association and periodic elections. These are democratic uh, mechanisms. Not only that, but this populism, as we've heard in the last day and a half, is a, perf uh, a performative style of politics that constantly refers to the people. What could be more democratic than that? And not only that, but this populism rightly points out that there, are, uh, there is a decadence, there are pathologies inside actually existing democracies. Um, the corruption of cartel parties, the growing social inequality and injustice, the churnalism uh, that is dubbed uh, fake news. And so far we didn't discuss this much, but one of its democratic features is surely that it takes advantage of what Robert uh, Musil in this period called the Mörglichkeitssinne. That is, democracy, it's Tocqueville's idea. Democracy stirs up a sense of contingency of power relations and it raises the possibility of hopes that things in the future could be different than now. I think that this populism uh, has this uh, democratic uh, principle. Andre Casa, who is one of the great uh, Latin American writers, he's Mexican, refers to um, the, the redemptive, apostolic zeal of populism. It raises hopes that things can be better. But it seems to me that although Max Weber did not uh, take this, these steps, that one of the striking things about this electoral populism is its pathologies. In my work, I try to describe this electoral populism as an autoimmune disease of democracy. Uh, biological metaphors in politics should be handled very carefully. But what I want to say is that it is a problematic response that inflames and damages the cells, the tissues, the organs of democratic institutions. That is to say, populism feeds upon, yet at the same time fails to deal with and therefore compounds the pathologies that are produced by the functioning and the malfunctioning of democracy. And this is true in uh, four senses. Um, this is what I've just said, so I go to this um, uh, question of pathologies, and four interconnected pathologies seem to me to uh, be uh, worthy of note. The most obvious pathology, we had too little discussion of it in the last day and a half, is that it's uh, dependent uh, in practice, its spirit, its language, its institutions are dependent upon political bosses. Populism requires big-mouthed uh, demagogues. It's a kind of devil's pact with leaders who pretend to be the earthly avatars of the people. Maduro, Chavez, Orban, Wilders, Fujimori, Trump, Kaczynski, the list goes on. These demagogues are not incidental uh, nor accidental features of populist politics in this sense, 
I think the Muda Kaltwasser thesis that uh, uh, populism is a thin ideology is empirically mistaken. It, it completely underestimates the way that um, if you're Montesquieu, you see that the spirit of populism functionally requires um, an avatar of the people because the people is an abstraction and so built into the logic of populism is what Trotsky called a substitutionism. Uh, you have to have a leader who is the uh, embodiment of the people. In this sense, populism is ventriloquism. Through acts of concealed representation, it incites and excites leaders who sometimes act as if they are, as in India, it's called chaiwala, uh, servants of the people, das, but who in reality are above the common herd. They are the ones who attract a coterie of lesser loyal people. So that um, uh, Nadi Urbanati, I think, is right, that the logic of populism is not we the people, but me the people. Uh, and this is manifested in some striking uh, um, explanations and self-justifications. Uh, Narendra Modi, after winning the 2014 election, said that he was elected by, and I'm quoting, the will of the people, blessed by the Hindu god Lord Krishna. This is a pretty big claim, that the Lord, the Hindu uh, god, is on his side. Second pathology, Jan Wernemüller has a version of this. Jean-Francois uh, made a good case for this through the thesis of de-differentiation. Pierre Rosavallon's new book on simplification says it. Populism, its pathology, uh, its second pathology is its simple-minded <coughs> mentality, its hostility to ambivalence, irony, complexity, and pluralism. One of the great weaknesses of number 45, I don't use his name anymore, 45th president, he can't stand uh, sarcasm and irony and jokes. It's the way to get him eventually, but so far we lack uh, a Charlie Chaplin who, so to say, will destroy his uh, authority. The point can be uh, toughened to say that um, big boss leaders, in order to survive and to make ground, have to actually um, deconstruct, de-differentiate, simplify, destroy flanking institutions. They don't like checks and balances. They don't like public uh, scrutiny and, and restraint of power, what I call monetary democracy. You can see this in all kinds of ways. Modi refers to prostitutes. This is a reference to journalism, prostitutes. Um, in Kenya, um, Uhuru Kenyatta rails against the thugs and foreigners and fools, he says, of the judiciary who rule against, quote, the will of the people. AMLO in Mexico is at the moment using the tactic of popular consultations uh, to destroy flanking institutions. He's currently attacking INE, the Election uh, Commission. One gets the feeling that the Brexiteers, some of them still, would actually like no deal uh, because they would like uh, the falling apart of uh, institutions that can prevent uh, their advances. And the tweeter in chief, let's call him, or better call him the saboteur in chief, is someone who has not only um, rounded on the NFL and Google and the Boy Scouts of America, um, conducted a war against Congress and successfully won, as we see from the failure of impeachment. He stacked the Supreme Court. He's now um, uh, on the cusp of controlling the Federal Reserve. Um, he has marginalized the State Department and the Justice Department, as we know from William Barr's outburst in the last 24 hours. And he has taken this um, destruction of flanking power-checking institutions into the global domain. So, for example, uh, has effectively paralyzed the appellate court of the WTO. This is all typical, um, a second uh, pathology that is, the checks and balances are anathema. And in this sense, when in government, populism uh, resembles a permanent coup d'etat. Third, a feature not much discussed in the last day and a half, is that in order to uh, maintain its momentum, this new populism um, has to have help from friends. It has to do in-grouping, 
We like to talk about outgrouping, more about that in a moment. But that means that you have to form alliances with rich and powerful people. Um, the promise to drain the swamp in Washington uh, quickly produced um, the, 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 the cabinet, which in the history of the American Republic had the highest concentration of billionaires. This is no uh, accident. Um, and it is why I think that even in cases like um, Venezuela, um, that revolution, that Bolivarian revolution, produced what Venezuelans call a bolly bourgeoisie, um, a, a new SUV driving, private plane flying uh, elite that profited from this, um, this populism. We know as well, th this is still the third point, that outgrouping is part of the logic of uh, populism. I agree here very much with um, Nadia Urbanati, who says that the logic of populism, using a Greek uh, neologism, is merolatria. That is, um, it's the cult of the part, which it tries to present as synonymous with the people, but populism uh, requires functionally the outgrouping of, um, uh, of uh, groups. And although it seems not to have taken root here in the last day, I think here there is a, an interesting idea that Bertolt Brecht in Die Lösung puts, uh, I mean, one feature of populism is the way that it tries to redefine who the people are. It doesn't like the actually existing people because it includes Muslims and, and LGBT people and Greens and so on. So it tries to re-elect re uh, a people uh, and on that basis get re-elected uh, indefinitely. Um, lots of instances of this. It helps explain, by the way, why there is a redistribution of who gets what, when, and how when populists come into office. Modi's toilet revolution is a case in point. Um, so too is the 500 plus uh, Zvati um, uh, uh, initiative uh, to promote family and, and uh, increase the birth rate in uh, Poland. Uh, we are about to see, I think, Johnson in Britain engage in a kind of uh, expenditure program designed to produce a new people that uh, continues to support him. And even um, number 45, you may know, is spending uh, considerably more on um, uh, black colleges and universities. Why does he do this? Because so there's a kind of redistribution of partial redistribution of power and wealth, which is part of this in-grouping, um, out-grouping. And fourth, um, and uh, finally, I think that it's not accidental as a pathology of this populism that populists typically think in territorial uh, terms. And that like Blue Awakening, they're attracted to bounded ter territorial states. They like borders, they like stricter visa and immigration rules, they talk of national sovereignty. And I think it's not accidental in the spirit of populism that um, there is a style of politics which is fascinated with and it's prone to violence and war. Nicolas Maduro's lawless armed gangs, the Colectivos, or Salvini's sympathy for gangs hunting immigrants, or your local Mart Helmer, who uh, remarked, I don't know how many times, it's pretty much symptomatic, why should we in fact spend taxpayers' money policing LGBT demonstrations because these are just parades of perverts. I mean, if you think about the logic of this, it's like, no, we won't police them, uh, you deal with them, um, possibly through uh, violence. And of course, we know about the dark energy of number 45, uh, urging police officers not to be, quote, too nice, campaign rallies, we're gonna hear it all about, knock the crap out of them, carry them out on a stretcher, and so on. Now, this um, is the first form of populism. I want to say something now about a text that is only translated into French, not into English, originally published in 1919 by Loriano uh, Vajonia Lanz. It is a book that proposes and recommends what he called democratic Caesarism. To put it very simply, this Barcelona-born, Venezuelan diplomat, scholar, who was also director of the National Archives, 
um, whose book is a defense of the Calvillo dictatorship of Juan Vicente Gomez in 1919, argues that the spontaneous um, uh, tendency in the human condition is anarchy, breakdown, lawlessness, and that therefore what is required is a Calvillo, a strong leader, a democratic Caesar, who recognizes that the age of the universal franchise um, is here, and who tries to bring social order, um, to bring, uh, to bring uh, law and government to uh, actually uh, constrain that anarchy. And for that to happen, to cure the hurt pride of flesh and blood people, they need to be empowered through the simulation of a representative of the people, a Kaiser, who is the avatar of popular sovereignty. You will spot uh, that this is drawn from the principles of Hobbes. Uh, in a way, a Laureano a Vianilla uh, merges popular sovereignty principle with that of Hobbes to argue for uh, a kind of Hobbesian populism, which today I want to suggest to you is manifested in what I would call state-managed uh, populism. I can't say very much about this, and I'm rather lost time, uh, Daniela, uh, so I'm waiting for the guillotine any minute. But what I want to say to you is that it's the subject of the book which is just about to come out, is that if you look at Russia, China, Saudi, Turkey, Hungary, Belarus, Vietnam, Uzbekistan, Singapore, and growing numbers of regimes, you find that they, despite the differences, have things in common. I call them despotisms. They are regimes of top-down power in which elections are practiced, in which the rulers constantly refer to the people. There is, a, a, there is so to say, a democratic Caesarism of these regimes in which patronage, clientelism, is very important. Dark money uh, plays a very important role. Regimes in which steady economic growth is promoted, in which there are sophisticated media controls, in which there are strangled judiciaries, in which there is dragnet surveillance, in which there is a camouflaging of violence. Most of the population does not live in fear in China or Russia, uh, but in fact, uh, enjoys a, a measure of order and um, witnesses daily the performances of the democratic, so to say, populist uh, Caesar. Now, if you look at these leaders, you will find that they um, perform in a populist uh, way. And so what I'm appealing for here is to widen the framework of the analysis of populism to make it more global and actually to pay attention to regimes that are, so to say, phantom populist uh, regimes in which the rulers showboat. I give one example, uh, Xi Jinping. He plays the role of the people's leader. Renmin Lingxiu is the Chinese. Um, he goes to a bun shop and sits with ordinary people to eat Chinese buns for a uh, mid-morning break. He rides a bicycle with his daughter. He goes on a poverty tour in Western China. When he's in Ireland, he kicks a Gaelic football. He has a wife, Pang Liuyan, uh, who has brought, as the Chinese say, high-heeled diplomacy to international affairs. The, 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 the example of China is not exceptional, and I think it's uh, one of the features of these um, new despotisms, these state-managed populisms, that there is, a, there is a kind of democratic Caesarism that um, Laureano uh, Vianila wrote about. I want to um, say uh, something briefly, and I'm beginning to end. Five minutes. This is going to be kangaroo hopping at its uh, fastest through this. Uh, it is a period in which, as you know, there is a lot of melancholy, um, and anxiety and um, gloom and despair. And I would um, say that we didn't much discuss it, although I think Paulina raised it. There are a lot of counter-trends going on that are not describable 
in populist terms. I'm suspicious of the talk of the populist moment or the populist zeitgeist as, because you see that there are advances in the field of breaking down uh, male domination and hypocrisy uh, in everyday life, hashtag me too. The, the extension of citizen rights to children, uh, the development of um, bioregional assemblies and other uh, m m examples of the greening of politics. Cities are great laboratories of new democratic innovations. And for this reason, I think Albert Hirschman's Frakasomania, which I think is untranslatable, I don't know in Estonian what this would be, but, you know, Frakasomani uh, uh, is the problem that you say everything is shit. And therefore, everything has to be changed. Uh, well, I am much more um, pragmatist. I think one in the analysis of populism needs to pay attention to uh, the counter trends. And for this, I finish, um, but with nine uh, tips about how to do it. Uh, I want to say, uh, I'll do it very quickly and we can discuss it. Um, I wrote a history of democracy and I'm struck by the way that what we now call populism is a recurrent autoimmune disease uh, in each of its historical phases. And the history of democracy is also the history of attempts to uh, build mechanisms to prevent demagogues and populism as, and its pathologies. So for example, uh, Athens invented this wonderful custom of ostrakismos. Uh, annually, you have a vote uh, to decide who is the most popular citizen and he gets removed for up to 10 years. You get rid of him because he's a danger to the assembly democracy. Or modern representative democracy, a phrase that developed at the end of the 18th century, um, uh, privileged the principle of liberty of the press. It's a way of, um, of preventing uh, demagogy plus multi-party systems, periodic elections, the whole idea of representation was designed to, uh, uh, to outflank that tendency. And I would say that we are living in times in which there is a rummaging around for uh, ways of interpreting uh, populism and for dealing with it. And I will just literally go through this, mentioning them point by point. One, public intellectuals um, do and must play an important role, but I'm going to say something very bad-mannered by saying that I'm very struck by the way intellectuals since the 18th century, Zygmunt Bauman pointed out, have a bad habit of, um, of falling in love with power. And I'm struck by the fascination with populism and the fence-sitting. Uh, I have to say that my student Ben Moffat's new book uh, does exactly this. It doesn't make up its mind as to whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, and this is very common in the Indian discussion, Kaltwasser and Muda also. Second reaction is what uh, I call the bee sting theory. Richard Hofstadter, uh, I think, I think, I think I need to give you this. Uh, Richard Hofstadter, um, the American historian, says that populism in democracy once in a while comes along, it stings the establishment and dies. Uh, this is optimistic. Third, um, there are recommendations on the basis of this. Larry Diamond, a very famous American figure, uh, told the BBC uh, in the last two years that the way to deal with populism was actually to absorb some of their language into mainstream politics. And he gave the example of how to deal with Hiet Wilders by uh, doing what Mark Rutte has done to declare multiculturalism dead. Uh, in my view, this is a, a defeat of the imagination, but we should discuss it. Um, uh, there is then, uh, fourthly, more um, extreme measures. Assassination. Um, you know, the <laughs> Narodniki showed in 19th century Russia that that's the way you can deal with uh, populists. Um, <laughs> Uh, this is how Taksin Shinawat was defeated in Thailand, and this is the way, of course, in Bolivia that Morales uh, was defeated um, uh, by Jeanine uh, Agnès, uh, one of whose first uh, actions was to call on the security forces to open fire on protesting uh, cocoa farmers, in which 
uh, quite a number of people died. And of course, it was the way that Perron, um, through military coup d'etat, uh, was dealt with in uh, Argentina. Fifth, left populism. Um, my dear friend and colleague in London, um, Chantal Mouffe, uh, has gone, so uh, it's a pity she is not here, but she will hear the music, so to say, when it goes up on YouTube. Uh, I mean, I have lots of problems with uh, left populism. If I am right about the pathologies, it's oxymoronic. A left populism is an oxymoron, uh, because no democracy can come from it. The destruction of democracy can certainly come from it, and which is why Chantal wants to say she's a liberal democrat. And I, yesterday I did not understand this unholy mix of liberal democracy and left populism. I, I simply don't understand what it means. But we should discuss it. Sixth, there are those, uh, David van Reybroek uh, in uh, Belgium and others, are championing deliberative democracy. The way to take the sting out of this populism and its pathologies is to try to institutionalize deliberative um, forums such as the Irish Citizens' Assembly, which very importantly led to the legalization of abortion in a Catholic country where this was probably unthinkable. Um, and one can say many things against deliberative democracy. I'm not a great fan. I think it misunderstands its own history. I think it's too rationalist. I think there's a scalability problem, and yet it may be part of the mix that is needed uh, to deal with populism. Seventh, Simon Sharma uh, in Britain, the FT's um, important correspondent, says that the real weapon with which to deal with this new populism and its pathologies is to reinvigorate, uh, breathe life back into uh, periodic free and fair elections. And in this sense, um, he thinks much can be learned from the Constant and, and Topfield and the American uh, founding fathers. Eighth, uh, you heard me say it in the last um, uh, day, uh, I think that this whole idea of monetary democracy, by which I mean not only free and fair elections periodically, but the building and protection of robust public accountability mechanisms, independent courts, investigative gate-watching journalism, anti-corruption commissions, uh, bioregional assemblies, the defense of expertise in uh, federal uh, bureaucracies, for example, are all really important strategically, normatively, um, uh, 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 tactics of, of preventing this uh, triumph of populism. And finally, a theme on which I worked for most of my life, I'd, I think after a brief holiday and disappearance of the phrase, civil society is back. And what we're witnessing is the development from below of citizens, um, elected and unelected representatives, defending um, peoples, flesh and blood peoples, against uh, this populism. Efforts to protect mosques and synagogues. Um, campaigns against racial and sexual violence. Street mutinies, I call them digital mutinies, of the extinction rebellion kind. Efforts to build sanctuary cities, independent trade unions, police monitoring groups, and so on, are part, I think, of this revival uh, uh, of interest, not only in Hong Kong or in Chile, but in practically every actually existing uh, democracy. The sardines in Italy, or um, a million lives in Czech Republic are examples. And I end um, by asking about the future. The future is by definition a closed book. It's an unsent text message. Um, she, the future, carefully guards her secrets. We are condemned to be ignorant about our fates. All that is true, and so, in the face of this, these dynamics of electoral and state-managed populism, it seems that we should prepare ourselves, not knowing the future, not knowing where this will all lead, to prepare ourselves for, take, for taking what comes our way, uh, for preparing for the worst, in order, I think, to build a better and more democratic future. Thank you very much.